Lightyear is an origin story for the character behind the Buzz Lightyear toy from the Toy Story series, so there are plenty of franchise-referencing Easter eggs in Disney Pixar's latest. Where have we heard the phrase Crystallic Fusion before? And why was that Zerg battle so familiar? Keep watching to find out. You can't separate Buzz Lightyear from his Space Ranger suit. Quite literally, in the Toy Story movies. Even though he gets some time out of the bubble helmet and Lightyear, Buzz still seems the most like himself when he's geared up in the green Galactic Alliance garb. There are a couple of different iterations of the Space Ranger suit that pop up throughout Lightyear, with the old-school model from the beginning and the updated version in the final scenes being the two main ones. They both include a lot of little details that are pulled straight out of Toy Story that longtime fans will surely catch. From the three brightly colored buttons on Buzz's chest plate to the wrist communicator he's constantly talking into, the Lightyear suit is a spot-on recreation of the toy. Or at least the new model scene at the end of the movie is. The older suits have some small differences, no wrist laser and a big red button instead of a switch on the front, revealed to be the shameful surrender button. But by the time the credits roll, Buzz and his team have all gotten their shiny new Space Ranger outfits, a design so cool that every kid in 1995 wanted to have one of their own. A lot of the story in Lightyear centers around Crystallic Fusion, the sci-fi method by which Star Command and its agents are able to achieve hyperspeed. When Buzz and the other inhabitants of the Star Command ship crash land at the start of the film, their old fusion core is destroyed forcing them to experiment with the resources available to them locally in the hopes of creating a new one. It's a process that takes decades, with Buzz undergoing numerous failed experiments with crystals that are just a little bit off. Finally, his robot companion Socks comes up with the correct solution, and a fully functional crystallic fusion core is created. Of course, crystallic fusion has been a part of Toy Story lore from the very beginning. In the original film, during Buzz and Woody's very first conversation, Buzz asks his future best friend a series of questions, believing himself to have landed on an alien planet. In the hope of repairing his ship, he asks Woody what power sources are available. People still use fossil fuels, or have you discovered crystallic fusion? Well, let's see. Uh, we got double A's. In the grand scheme of things, this is a tiny detail buried in a throwaway line, so it's cool to see Lightyear remain so loyal to the idea in its own story. There are a lot of lines in Lightyear that are taken straight out of the Toy Story movies. Like, a lot. Some of them will be immediately obvious to anyone familiar with the earlier movies. For instance, at the very beginning of Lightyear, when Buzz and Alicia are exploring the alien planet, Buzz records a mission log commenting on the landscape, observing that the terrain seems a bit unstable. Of course, this is also his comment when walking around on Andy's bed in the original Toy Story. Terrain seems a bit unstable. There are a bunch of callbacks like this scattered throughout Lightyear. Classics like I'm Buzz Lightyear, I'm Always Sure and Not Today, Zerg add a nice texture to the film by connecting it repeatedly back to Toy Story. It's fun to see all the little ways in which the toy Buzz pulls his personality from his fictional self, and the many catchphrases are a great way of showing that. The first act of Lightyear is a roller coaster, to say the least. After crashing on the alien planet and setting up a colony, Buzz and Star Command begin working on a new crystallic fusion core to reactivate hyperspeed and get everybody off world. Buzz flies the first test mission for the core, which is supposed to take him 4 minutes and 28 seconds. However, due to the temporal distortion of hyperspeed, more than four years have passed by the time Buzz lands. Time dilation is certainly not a new concept in the sci-fi genre, but in the modern context of the genre, it's hard not to draw a direct comparison to Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, which features a devastating moment of severe time dilation. Buzz's four years aren't nearly as long as the amount of time skipped in Interstellar, but the effect is still unnerving. What's arguably even more unsettling is that Buzz continues to volunteer for more test flights, knowing full well that he'll lose years every time. Despite the fact that his voice actor, anatomy, and universe are all completely different, Buzz himself stays remarkably consistent to his Toy Story characterization in Lightyear. Some of his personality traits are obvious — the need to constantly record his mission log, his wariness, and his hyperfixation on the mission at hand. But some of the other consistencies are much smaller and easier to miss. For instance, Buzz's resistance to teamwork, and specifically to working with anyone he deems unqualified, is very true to his portrayal in the first Toy Story. In fact, he experiences very similar arcs in the two films 
going from a moody loner to a willing member of a larger community. Buzz's general hesitation at normal social interaction and relationship building is also something that's kept the same from Toy Story, as the character is always more focused on his mission in both instances. By keeping all these little personality touches the same, Pixar pulls off an impressive balancing act, creating a version of the character who feels new, while at the same time being a continuation of what's been established in the past. The opening of Lightyear says that it was released in 1995 in the Toy Story timeline. While it would have been easy for the film to completely ignore that detail later on, it remains an active component of the overarching style. A lot of the movie takes inspiration from even older sci-fi franchises like Buck Rogers. But there are a number of details that feel specifically 90s in nature. During Buzz's first hyperspeed test flight, for example, his autopilot system Ivan starts malfunctioning. Buzz pulls Ivan out of the ship's system, revealing it to be nothing more than a blocky plug-in, and blows into it like it's an NES cartridge. Sure enough, the autopilot immediately starts to work as intended. This isn't the only 90s detail that comes up, either. Many of the digital readouts in Lightyear have the blocky overlays of 90s computer screens, which makes sense for a movie that's supposed to have been released in 1995. Obviously, Lightyear pulls from all eras of science fiction, and it still feels like a contemporary animated movie in its overall structure. But still, it's fun to see that the writers committed to the mid-1990s setting in multiple ways. When you make a big-budget science fiction movie, it's only right that you pay homage to the greats of the genre. Lightyear takes that obligation quite seriously, and one of its most clever sci-fi references is to none other than Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. After things go wrong on his first hyperspeed test flight, Buzz frantically tries to get his ship back to the ground in one piece. Unfortunately, his autopilot Ivan is more of a hindrance than a help. In a fit of frustration, Buzz shouts the order, Open the fuel door, Ivan. The computer responds, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. A clear parody of Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Not only is this a sneaky reference to 2001, but it's also a joke about how Siri and other real-world voice command and navigation systems often mishear things. This isn't the first time that Buzz Lightyear has been part of a 2001 Easter egg. In the opening sequence of Toy Story 2, which is set in a video game starring the Space Ranger, the film's iconic theme music is played via a series of floating platforms. Clearly, someone at Pixar has a lot of love for 2001. It's no secret that Pixar loves spoofing Star Wars and its Buzz Lightyear storylines. Zurg is basically a big, silly purple Darth Vader with Emperor Palpatine's title. And if you thought that Lightyear would mark the end of Buzz's history of Star Wars references, you'd be very wrong. The big one in Lightyear is more subtle than some of the ones in the Toy Story films, but it should still stick out to those who know both series well. Socks, Buzz's robotic cat comrade, is able to interface with various computer systems using a plug in the tip of his tail. When he interfaces and starts hacking, his head spins around in full 360 degrees, and he starts mumbling beep boop beep boop over and over again. It's a funny gag, if a pretty simple one, and it seems like a pretty clear reference to R2-D2's own hacking habits in Star Wars. As the Toy Story movies constantly remind us, Buzz Lightyear is a cool toy. He comes with karate chop action, a wrist-mounted laser, and a winged jetpack. All of these special abilities come into play in Lightyear as well, with some proving crucial. At multiple points throughout the film, Buzz shows off his karate chop action, which manifests as a far more versatile collection of martial arts skills. His wrist laser doesn't come with the old Space Ranger suit model, but in the third act of the film, Buzz improvises by strapping a smaller standalone laser blaster to his wrist for easy use. The weapon comes in handy in his battle with Zerg, and when the new Space Ranger suits are revealed at the end of the film, they all have wrist lasers built in. As for Buzz's winged jetpack, Pixar waits most of the movie to reveal it. Only when the rest of the team is re-entering the atmosphere in their ship does Buzz pop the wings to try to help keep the vessel on course. It all works out, though the re-entry could definitely be classified as falling with style. You're mocking, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah, but in a supportive way. Lightyear wouldn't be complete without a proper battle between Buzz and Zerg, and that's exactly what the film delivers in its third act. The two go head-to-head -head in a heated fight that spans Zerg's dreadnought and even extends to the open space beneath it, with Buzz ultimately coming out victorious. While not a carbon copy, the Lightyear fight does have some similarities to the Zerg battles in the Toy Story movies. 
For instance, the shot where Buzz jumps and front flips over Zerg, then turns to quickly fire a laser back, is taken right out of the Buzz Lightyear video game Rex plays at the beginning of Toy Story 2. Fortunately, the real Buzz has better luck than Rex. And, of course, the last round of the Rivals Duel in Lightyear, which takes place in the Void of Space, features a classic exchange between the two. Zerg orders Buzz to prepare to die, and Buzz retorts, not today, Zerg. We all knew it was coming, but it's still fun to hear. The ending of Lightyear foreshadows a bright future for Buzz, his friends, and the Galactic Alliance. The Space Ranger Corps is reinstated with state-of-the-art tech, and Buzz's team becomes officially sanctioned for high-priority missions. Their first assignment? Head to the Gamma Quadrant of Sector 4 for some investigating. That destination may ring familiar if you grew up on Toy Story. I'm stationed up in the Gamma Quadrant of Sector 4. As a member of the elite Universe Protection Unit of the Space Ranger Corps, the location is mentioned again in Toy Story 2, as it's the setting of Buzz's video game battle with Zerg. It's nice to see Pixar staying so consistent with the silly lore they've created over the decades. Since the Buzz toy has all the memories of his fictional self, it makes sense that he'd have a strong association with this particular locale. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about Lightyear are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.